<laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Uh, how appropriate that you, get, you told that story today because today we're talking about murder. <laughs> we really are, actually. <laughs> so Sarah and I have been on quite a journey together. And no, I just wanted to tell you because I prefaced it that way. The story of me and Sarah does not end with murder. <laughs> I just want to clarify that from the beginning. So Sarah is my wife, and I love her so much. Um, Sarah and I have been on just this incredible journey together throughout our lives. And it all started when I first moved out to Federal Way, maybe five, not quite six years ago, um, to start my job teaching. And I went to this church, this young adults group at church, and she was one of the leaders there. And I just remember seeing her on stage, and she was doing generosity time, or she was giving announcements or something. And I just remember seeing her and just being so impressed with her. She just has this way, and if you've met Sarah, you know this. Sarah has this way that she carries herself. Um, she carries her, herself with self-respect and dignity that um, it's just you don't see it as much as you should in this world. And I just, I fell in love with her. <laughs> And so um, as time went on, you know, we started out as friends. Um, I finally worked up the courage to ask out a girl who's so much out of my league. <laughs> um, so much. Um, and we started dating. And so we took our relationship to the next level. We started out as friends, then we were dating. And then a couple months later, I worked up enough courage in my heart again, and I asked her to marry me. I, and we got engaged. And there's a great story about that, like our engagement story. I'll tell you another time, but I did, I did a good job. Um, <laughs> and so we took our relationship to the next level. And then, a little sooner, little, you know, just a couple months later, we were married. And yeah, isn't she beautiful? <laughs> well, I, just, I turned my head from the camera because it's like, let's just, let's just focus on the main event here. <laughs> let's just focus on what God has done well. Um, <laughs> And then from this point, so we got married really fast. Like basically our story, if I could like summarize it, it's boom, 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 boom. <laughs> let's, get, let's, let's get her done. Let's get her. And then um, just a few months later, after we got married, again real soon, <laughs> we found out that Sarah was pregnant. I know, yeah. <laughs> Not what we planned, but we, we put it in God's hands, and he, he blessed us tremendously. And so time goes on, and we have actually have two kids now. Our firstborn is named Claire, Claire Elizabeth, and our secondborn is named Danny, Daniel Joseph. And this is a picture of two of them together. And then the next picture is of we just took yesterday with their great-grandmother, Carol. Yeah, they love each other. Claire just, like, dotes over her little brother, <laughs> little Danny. And so the reason why I share with this with you um, is not just, you know, I didn't do it just as an excuse to show pictures of my beautiful family. <laughs> so that may have uh, motivated me a little bit. Um, I share this with you because in all of our lives, we have relationships. And we take those relationships steadily and steadily to higher and higher levels, to next level, the next level. And this next sermon series that we're going to be going on is called Next Level relationships, about how we as Christians, Jesus is calling us to take our relationships with him and with others to the next level. You see what I did there? And really kind of the, the cornerstone verse of this series is Matthew chapter 5, verses 20, talking about next level relationships and how in order to achieve them, we need next level righteousness. So Matthew 5, verse 20. Jesus says, as he's teaching, But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Everyone say, yikes. <laughs> so Jesus is calling us to next level righteousness, next level relationships with others. And he's challenging our perception, as we'll learn in the next couple of weeks. He's challenging our perception of what it means to actually be good, of what it means to actually be righteous, what it means to have positive, life-giving, loving relationships 
with others, with the people around you. So today we're going to be talking about murder. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> today we're going to be talking about anger <laughs> and how it leads to murder. So can Jesus continues on. Go to verse 21. And this is the first thing he talks about, so you know it's pretty important. And Jesus says, You have heard that our ancestors were told, You must not murder. If you commit murder, you're subject to judgment. But I say, so he's, he's making a contrast here, but I say, if you are even angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. Uh-oh. If you call someone an idiot, you're in danger of being brought before the court. Some of you called someone an idiot on the way to, to church today. And if you curse someone, you're in danger of the very fires of hell. Now, Jesus begins this with, with a command that I think most of us are pretty okay with. He says, thou shalt not murder. And uh, raise your hand if you're okay with that command. Like, does anyone have a problem? Okay, pretty much everyone. If, if you didn't raise your hand, we have to talk after service. <laughs> I'm going to bring the security team yeah. with me, though, too. <laughs> Yes, I think that's pre it's a pretty universal commandment. Like, even if you're not a Christian, even if, you're, even if you're an atheist, even if you just reject God completely, I think most people on the earth, probably 98, 99% people, would agree murder equals bad, right? <laughs> and the Jews and the Pharisees back in Jesus' time, they were all for that. They're like, yes, absolutely, murder's bad. Murder is bad. So they thought, they thought about it like, as long as I'm not going around killing people, as long as I'm not just shanking people left and right, I'm fine, right? I'm fine. I'm okay. And that's how we kind of think about this too, right? That's not what Jesus is saying. That's not enough for him. That's not enough for our Father in heaven. It's not enough to only just not go around killing people. We need to actually start, we need to actually stop sin at the heart level, where it starts. Jesus challenges this perspective and says, if you're even angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you're in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. Everyone say, oh no. We're in trouble. <laughs> We're in big trouble. How many of you have been angry lately? You don't need to raise your hand. Just raise it in your heart. <laughs> How many of you have maybe called someone an idiot when they cut you off in traffic? <laughs> Some of you are raising your hands. <laughs> I didn't ask for it. I just want you to know. How many of you have actually cursed someone? Now, this word for curse, it could mean to actually like curse someone's very existence. It could mean to call someone a fool. But I think it goes deeper than just calling someone a name. I think that cursing someone, this is like challenging their very existence, saying, I wish you weren't even here. I wish you were dead. And really, in effect, that is what murder is, right? It's looking at someone saying, I don't like you. I wish you weren't here anymore. And you can carry that action out through physical murder and their time on earth, or you can literally kill them in your mind, kill them in your heart, cut them off, Jesus is challenging our perception of sin. He's saying that sin is not only the action carried out, actions like murder, like theft, like lust, like anything else. It's not only the action carried out, it's also the thoughts, the heart motivations that bring it about. Sin begins at the heart level and it grows from there. Think of it like it's like a tiny seed planted in your heart. Someone does something that just makes you mad, just ticks you off, and in your heart you plant a seed. And then from that tiny seed, as you pour into it, because we do this, right? We like, when someone makes us mad, we like to kind of, like, we like to convince ourselves, like, I feel bad, but it kind of feels good to kind of pour into that a little bit. You know what I mean? It's like we get this idea that like, my anger is righteous. How many of you have heard that term? I have righteous anger. Okay, first off, I guarantee you that probably 99.99% of your anger is not righteous. Okay, I think only God can really claim that. But we like to feel bad for ourselves. It almost, it's like, um, 
it, it feels like, it feels good sometimes to say, I'm so mad, I just want to I just want to feed it. I want it to grow. And as that anger grows, and as you cultivate that anger, it increases to more and more and more heinous types of sin. That's why we see this pattern. There's an amping up. Anger leads to insults, which leads to cursing. And if we follow the pattern even longer, it would lead to murder. If you, I believe if you continue to feed your anger, to continue to let it grow, to cultivate it from a heart level, you'd kill people. And that's what happened to Cain and Abel in the story that Stephen shared with us. Cain was angry in his heart at what God had done to him. And so he cultivated that anger, just like he cultivated his crops. And it grew and grew and grew to the point where he said, well, fine, if God, you're only going to accept, accept the sacrifice of my brother, if you're only going to accept one, I'll make it mine. I'll just get rid of him so that the best sacrifice will be mine. Because if you take away first place, you become first place. I don't know if that's what happened in his heart, but I can imagine his thoughts level, his thought level, and that might have been what motivated him. We see this kind of anger being cultivated all the way to the point, anger to insults, to cursing, to murder. We see it in our culture every day. You know, not just physical, like, you know, occasionally we see on the news, someone has literally killed someone. But we see it more often in, mo in all of our lives. There are people in this room who practice murder on a daily basis through something called cancel culture. Have you heard of that term? Cancel culture is the idea that if somebody does something wrong to, in your eyes, somebody hurts you, somebody makes you feel angry, you cut them off. I'm not going to support you. I'm not going to look at you. I'm, not even, I'm going to pretend you don't even exist, and I'm going to tell everyone else around me to do the same. This is what happened to my pillow guy. Remember my pillow guy? <laughs> I don't know his real name. <laughs> so my pillow guy, um, he's actually a, a Christian. Um, he used to be a drug addict, but he found the Lord, and the Lord helped cure him of his addiction. And he's also very pro-Trump. Um, and so a couple months ago, around the time of our election, he made some comments to the news that basically he thought that the election was not what it should have been. And so because of that, mainstream media got so mad about this that they called all of his suppliers, all the people who sold my pillow in the stores, and they say, if you do not pull my pillow from the shelves, we are going to tell everyone that you support Trump. <laughs> that you, and I'm not making a political statement. This is just, a, this is just a, an example. We're going to tell everyone that you do that. We're going to tell everyone you're a bigot. We're going to tell people all these bad things about you. We're going to tell Instagram. We're going to tell Twitter, BuzzFeed, whatever. Don't go to Bed Bath & Beyond. Don't go to Kohl's anymore. Don't go to Target. And so they did. Bed Bath & Beyond, Kohl's, Target. They caved, and they actually pulled his product from the shelves. And all around in our social media, we all did the same. Maybe not you guys, but a lot of people did. They said, what you did, my pillow guy, made me so angry, I'm going to, in effect, kill you. I'm going to hurt your family, hurt your finances. I'm going to make it so that people hate you because of what you did. He made, a comment, he made a comment on his belief about the election. He didn't hurt anybody. That's the culture we're living in today. And I think it's not just something that we see on the mainstream media. I think it's something that we do on our own, in our own personal relationships too. Someone wrongs us, someone hurts us. Maybe you've forgiven them a couple times and then someone just does something to tick you off. Jack stole my power drill. He didn't return it. I lent, it to, I lent my power drill to him four years ago, and he still hasn't returned it, turned it yet. That Janie was gossiping about me in the church lobby, and I have had it. I'm over her. I'm not even going to talk to her. In fact, I'm going to take her seat and chair in church. <laughs> that front center pew is mine. <laughs> right? It's the same thing. You are, in effect, killing someone cutting off their, your relationship with them because they made you mad. 
And that is not what you should be doing. We as Christians need to stop our anger in the heart, at the heart level, before it cultivates, before it grows, before it gets stronger and bigger and worse and worse and worse. We need to cut it off at the roots because it will lead you down the path of destruction. Just like it was saying, it will lead you to the courts, to death, to the fires of hell. You need to forgive others when they wrong you, intentionally or unintentionally, and, a lot of, and you do not need to wait for them to apologize. They should apologize. That's their responsibility, but it is also your responsibility as a Christian to forgive them before they apologize. Some people you're so mad at, they don't even think they did anything wrong right? We've all met people. It's like they just go through our, their lives and they really, they honestly, truly in their heart, they don't believe they hurt you. Because as, Chris, as, as humans, we're fallen. We don't understand the effects of our actions truly. And so if you have anger in your heart toward other people, you need to let it go. You need to forgive them from the bottom of your heart. And I'm going to be really honest, sometimes just saying in your head, I forgive them, It's not enough. It's not enough for your own heart. You need to verbalize it. I forgive you, Jack. I forgive you, Janie. There's power in words. Amen? There's a reason that our God spoke this world into existence. He didn't just snap his fingers. He spoke it. It's because there's power. And when you speak forgiveness into the world, I believe the reason, like one of the reasons God calls us, the, we're the image bearers of God. He created mankind in his image is because we are many creators. We make things, we make music, we make buildings, we make all this stuff. And our words, when we speak things, we are actually calling them into existence. So when you speak forgiveness into existence, it is more real than if you just started it in your heart. That's what I'm calling you to do today. Forgive others when they wrong you, just like Jesus did for you. Romans 5 says that even while you were still sinners, Christ died on the cross for you. Jesus did it before you said sorry. Jesus did it before you were even born, before you were even a twinkle in your mother's eye. So we need to do the same thing. You need to do the same thing. Have a little more grace for people. Not everyone is as holy as you are. Okay? <laughs> Most of us don't even know when we wrong each other, okay? Because we're called to have next level relationships with others. And it starts at the heart level. Amen? Amen. Well, if Jesus ain't done yet, he continues on, verse 23, and he says, So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple, and you suddenly remember your sacrifice there at the altar, Go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. So I want to clarify something about this situation because I think when we talk about it, we get it wrong a lot. Um, Because of what I was just talking about in my previous point, because what Jesus was just talking about before, where other people were at fault, other people hurt us, we tend to read that into this section too. And that is not the case. What it's it's actually saying here in the text is if you are standing at the altar about to offer your sacrifice to God, which back in the day, back in Jesus' time, that was worship. Worship was offering your sacrifices to God. Nowadays when we worship, you know, we raise our hands, glory to God. We come to church, we give. What Jesus is saying is that if you, let me start this way. If What Jesus is not saying is you come up to the front, to the altar, you're worshiping. Great are you, Lord. And then all of a sudden, it pops into your mind. Wait a second. Jack never returned my power drill. What a jerk. I hate that guy. That was like seven years ago. I knew I was missing a power drill. I only have four now. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's saying this. You're sitting at the altar. You're worshiping the Lord. Great are you, Lord. 
you're praying, you're giving, you're tithe. And all of a sudden it pops in your head. Shoot. I never returned Jack's power drill. I've had that thing for like seven years. I always wondered where it came from. I just assumed it was a gift or something. In this verse, you're the one at fault. In this verse, you are the one who messed up. It says, if someone has something against you, if someone has dirt on you, you need to, when you're in the middle of worship, stop what you're doing, leave your stuff on the altar, go talk to them. Go and be reconciled to them. Because you, if you know that you are the one in the wrong, you do need to be the initiator of reconciliation. I know what I said in the previous point, and that is still true. I said, even if, someone doesn't, if someone's wronged you they didn't, and they don't come up to you, you still need to forgive them. That is true. But also, in the same respect, if you do realize you wronged someone, you also need to be the one who asks for forgiveness. Okay? Worry about yourself. Yeah. Worry about yourself. Take care of your business. Yeah. If you've wronged someone, ask for forgiveness. This reconciliation is so important. Jesus says to leave everything behind. Forget about everything else, including something as important as worship. Jesus is saying to you, if you have messed up with someone, if you have broken relationship with someone, don't even think about worshiping me. Go take care of your business. Fix it. Ask them for forgiveness. Then come back and worship me. Because we worship the God of reconciliation. We worship the God of making peace. We worship the God of forgiveness. So how can we even think of worshiping him if we do not do what he does? If we do not reconcile, if we do not forgive others, it doesn't make sense. When we are Christians, you know what Christian means? Christian means little Christ. So if we call ourselves Christians, that means we need to be doing the things that Christ did. And Christ forgave. Christ sought reconciliation. Christ never sinned against anyone else. But he still was the initiator of reconciliation with all mankind. And Jesus continues on in verse 25, and he says, Similarly, when you were on the way to court with your adversary, Settle your differences quickly. Otherwise, your accuser may hand you over to the judge who will hand you over to an officer and you're going to be thrown in prison. And if that happens, you surely won't be free again until you've paid the very last penny. So once again, in this situation, you're the one at fault. You're the one who messed up. And you can, there's this, there's this parallel you can see in this passage tying the first and second points together. Jesus said in verse 22, but I say if you're even angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you're in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. So similarly, just as if you hold anger in your heart for someone else, just the same way as if you are, if you need to seek forgiveness for someone else, it says, otherwise, your accuser may hand you over to the judge. Judge, judgment. Who will hand you over to an officer, an officer of the court. And if that happens, then you'll be thrown into prison. Prison, the flaming fires of hell. To me, this demonstrates just the seriousness, both of anger toward others, but also of unrepented sin. They are both leading you down a deep, dark path of destruction that will only lead to more and more broken relationships between yourself and others, and also yourself and God. Because our sins have a penalty. Our sins have a deep penalty. And yes, our penalty, the penalty for our sins was paid by Jesus on the cross. It was. So, so that when we stand before God on judgment day, 
he's going to look at us because we are Christians, because we put our faith in him and say, this is my child. I see the righteousness of Christ in him, in her. That's true. But guess what? We don't see each other that way, right? God may have imputed Jesus' righteousness onto you, but when I look at you, when you look at your husband, when you look at your wife, do you see the imputed righteousness of Christ? No, of course not. I see how you've sinned against me. You see how others have sinned against you. You see just, we're, we're still human. We haven't, we haven't been made fully complete in Christ. In Jesus' eyes, in God's eyes, he sees us as perfect. But we ain't there yet. We're not there yet. Our sins still have earthly consequences. If you lie to your spouse, there's going to be a consequence even before you get to heaven. If you steal from the store, there's going to be a consequence. If you kill someone, there's going to be a consequence. However, because of our relationship with Jesus, because of what he did for us, we are able to pursue righteousness. What Jesus is calling us to in in these passages is next-level righteousness, next-level relationships. These kind of relationships were not attainable before Jesus came. So because of the Holy Spirit that dwells within you, becoming a Christian, we are now able to look at ourselves and say, oh no, I messed up. I need to go seek forgiveness from the person I harm. I can look at myself. You can look at yourself and say, why am I so angry at this person? I have let anger grow in my heart for too long. I need to cut it out. You now have the power to do that through Jesus, through his spirit. And that's what Jesus is calling you to do today. Today. Everyone say today. There are situations in your life where you know that you're in the wrong. Or maybe someone lets you know. Isn't that great? (laughs) But there's a part of you that doesn't want to admit it. There's a part of you that doesn't want to say, I'm sorry, I've I've done wrong. That's called pride. And you need to kick that part of you in the pants as soon as possible. Right now, today. If you have sinned against others, humble yourself. Go up to them and ask for forgiveness. It really is. It's a humbling experience to ask for forgiveness from somebody else. It is literally like getting down on your hands and knees and saying, I'm sorry. But that's what Jesus calls you to do. And there's a lie of the enemy that goes around in every single one of our heads that says, well, I shouldn't, why, why would I bring it up? Like, there's no reason I should bring it up. Like, I don't want to make waves. They probably don't even remember. Like, I, I know I hurt them, but really, like, I sh- it's such a pain to go up and, and talk about it. I'm sure they don't even care anymore, right? That's a lie because of what Jesus talked about before. <laughs> when someone sinned against you, you know what happens in your own heart. The anger grows and grows and grows and becomes more and more grievous. And so you, if you've sinned against other people, you need to go up to them. You need to ask for forgiveness, both for your sake and for the sake of them. To stop the anger in their heart from growing. I remember when I was a kid, just the, the way my dad approached this. And my dad's a very, a very firm man. He's a very, he's a very strong leader. He's a very strong, uh, a strong dad, a strong father figure. And so for most of, most of my life, it was very much like, okay, dad is right. Because he's the father, he has an authority over us, and, he, and he's right. But there were times, and that's true, there were times in my life where I remember when my dad messed up. And my dad did something that, that was wrong. And we all do it. Every single dad in here is going to do it. Every single mom's going to do it. We're all going to sin in that way. 
But some of the most powerful moments of my life were when my dad, when he knew he was wrong, he came up to me. Imagine me like a 10, 12-year-old scrawny little boy. (laughs) My dad came up to me, six foot one. My dad's a big guy. And humbling himself to a child and saying, Christian, I'm sorry. I messed up. Will you forgive me? Do you think I hate my dad for that? No. Of course not. Because my dad loved me so much. He was willing to ask for forgiveness. He valued my relationship with him so much, more than his own pride, that he was willing to lay it down and ask for my forgiveness. I'm just a kid. Nobody will look down on you for asking for forgiveness. They may look down on you for what you did in the past, for your sin. But bringing it to a reconciliation, bringing it to a resolution, will only bring good. That is my promise to you. It is a lie of the enemy that says you do not need to reconcile with others. You do not need to ask for forgiveness. You do not need to forgive. I'm calling it out. I'm calling you out. It's a lie. Seek forgiveness. Build deep, lasting relationships with others. That is how you become a Christian. That's how you act out as a Christian. That's how you, you demonstrate the love and affection of Christ in your life. Amen? Amen. That's what Jesus is calling you to do today. Now, I want to pray for you because I know this is an issue that a lot of us, probably all of us, struggle with. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, how many of you, and you can raise your hand, would say that you struggle with feeling, ang- you're, you're angry at somebody, even right now or in the past, and you feel in your heart either this anger is just starting or you just feel it starting to grow and it's consuming your life and you just want to be free of it. How many of you are angry at someone? Would you just raise your hand? Yeah, a lot. I want to pray for you. Jesus, I lift up these people to you. These people who who confess that there's anger in their heart. Maybe people have wronged them. Probably that is what happened, that someone sinned against them. Jesus, help them to forgive. Help them to forgive others. And everyone in the room, regardless of whether you held, held your hand up or not, I want you to speak into existence your forgiveness. So when I say, Lord, I forgive them, you say it too. Lord, I forgive them. In Jesus' name, amen. That is the first step of forgiveness. And that is something that you might need to repeat (laughs) over and over again until it really becomes true. Because we can say it once and we know in our hearts sometimes it doesn't become true right away. Continue on the path of forgiveness. Do not let anger grow in your heart. Do not become bitter, angry, a mean person. And then there are others of you in this room, you're realizing, I messed up. I've sinned against someone. Is there anyone in here who just, when we all close our eyes and bow our heads, you'd raise your hand and say, I've sinned against someone. My hand is up. And I want to seek forgiveness for that. Yeah. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray that you would give these people your courage. Give these people your power. Give them your forgiveness, your spirit of never-ending forgiveness, Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would just give them the courage to seek reconciliation with others, to not, not be afraid of what, the, what, they would, what other people would think, but to only think about what you would think, to only think about what is to be gained, a restored relationship, peace with others. Help them in this way, Jesus. 
In your name, amen. And as humans, we can only do so much. <laughs> we can only do so much in the way of forgiveness. The only person who is able to 100% forgive all of your sins was Jesus Christ when he died on the cross for you. He is the one who can give you his righteousness. He can say, I take all the sins, all the bad things, all the nasty things you've said, all the bad things you've done, I take them upon myself. I will die unto you. Die before the Lord so that you can be righteous, so that you can stand before God and say, I'm clean, wearing the blood of Christ. But the thing about this righteousness, the thing about this salvation that Jesus offers is that you need to accept it. It's not something that's just poured out over, it is poured out for mankind, but you need to grab onto it. You need to hold on to it and ask him for forgiveness. You need to turn from your sins, turn your life over to God and follow him to become a Christian. And so I want to offer you the opportunity to do that today. So once again, this is the last prayer. With every eye closed, every head bowed, is there anyone in this room, whether you are in person or whether you are online, if you're online, you can raise your hand too, that would say, I want to follow Jesus. I want to be freed from my sins. I want to be righteous in God's sight. Would you raise your hand? Yeah, I see those hands. And if you're raising them online, I believe we have one, two people online who are raising their hand. Let's repeat after me. Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I turn from my sins. Forgive me, Jesus. I turn to you and I ask you to be my Savior. Give me your righteousness, Jesus. And I will follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. There is something powerful that happens in a Christian's life, in a, a human's life, when they accept Jesus as their, Lord of, as their Lord and Savior. Their life is fundamentally changed. They are able to pursue next-level relationships just like this. They are able to forgive and seek forgiveness in a way that was never possible before. And so I challenge you, those of you for, who have been Christians forever, and those of you who just accepted Jesus into your heart, to pursue these relationships. Love others the way Jesus loved you. And if you did accept Jesus for the first time today, would you just please let us know? Because we don't want you to go on this journey alone. We want to walk alongside of you. Would you just text RESTART to 97,000? It's a way you're restarting your life. It's a do-over. And we'd love just to walk alongside you. Well, it was so good to be here with you guys today. God bless you. I love you all. Wow, such good church students. You have a way of preaching that always keeps me on the edge of my seat. And I also love how you never water down the word of God. You 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 share it uncompromisingly, and that and that's just powerful. What a powerful word, you guys. So listen, if you are new today, could you text GREET to 97000? We would love to meet you, to welcome you, to get to know you, and that's just the first step in helping us do that. Amen? So um, Pastor Garen and Shelly printed off these awesome new invite cards. Um, Pastor Garen has been talking about being people of influence, and that is who we are. So let's be salt and light in our community. Um, if when you go out into the lobby on the tables out there, grab as many as you can, and let's invite people to our church services now that we're in our new location. This is a perfect time to let people know we're here. Amen. Yeah.
Amen. And if you are watching online, just want to remind you to like our videos, subscribe to our channel, and that helps people to see us online. I'm excited um, that you guys are here today, and I can't wait to see you guys next week right here in our new loca location. Have a wonderful week.